Conference Hall, Waiaki Way. Follow the conversation on our social media platforms to share how we can ensure sustainable utilization of animals in a world where they live free from cruelty and suffering. Transform Kenya. Empower our nation. and gentlemen welcome back to the second part of transform kenya and if you're joining us from home we are coming to you live from the desmond tutu conference hall here in westlands nairobi and tonight our focus is on animal welfare and protection in kenya before we went on break on, on the first part of our discussion we really set the agenda on why is it important to talk about animal welfare and uh, what does it mean we discussed what animal welfare is vis-a-vis -vis animal rights and that's where we kick-started this conversation which we are about to continue now so allow me to reintroduce our panelists who are with us tonight uh, from my extreme left uh, mr. Steve McIver is the CEO of world animal protection thank you sir for being with us Dr. Joan uh, Maguero is the Assistant Director of Veterinary Services at the State Department of Livestock, which is housed within the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us. We also have uh, Dr. Victor Yamo, who is the Campaigns Manager, Animals in Farming uh, at the World Animal Protection Africa office. Thank you, Dr. Yamo. And to my immediate left is Dr. Tabitha Kimani, who's the regional social economist at FAO's Emergency Center. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And driving this conversation with me tonight, uh, my name is Sharon Mumani, uh, is my colleague, Abi Agina, who has been monitoring this conversation online as well as from the audience. Abi. Well, many thanks, Sharon. And of course, Sharon, together with your panelists, you actually deserve a round of applause. Let me welcome our live audience to just appreciate our lovely panelists this evening with a round of applause. <laughs> Sharon, I can tell you for a fact that it's not just about the panelists. We'll be taking questions from the live audience as well as from our viewers who are streaming using various social media platforms. We'll also be taking some questions on social media. But Sharon, to open up the floor to just get some comments as well, we shall be inviting Dr. James Kitaka, who is with us this evening, just to talk to us about what he makes of this very important discussion on animal welfare. And thereafter, I will be taking a few questions where I will be requesting you to quickly introduce yourself and shoot your question direct to a particular panelist. Dr. Gidaka. I think if we have a microphone, he's right in front. All right, a microphone is coming his way in just a minute. As we take the mic to him, let me just quickly engage, engage some of the audiences on our social media, Sharon. We have African Sustainability Network, which is saying, just how available are these veterinary services to the local farmers? A very interesting question there, Sharon. We also have uh, another question here from uh, John saying that whether legal or illegal, all wildlife trade is associated with an excess of animal welfare as well as conservation concerns. I understand uh, Dr. Ari is now ready to give his comments. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, do I stand or get seated? I don't know. <laughs> My name is James Kithuka. I am from the Brook East Africa and Equine Welfare Charity. This discussion that we are having today is extremely important. Why? Because we live in an environment where humans, animals, and also the, the entire environment actually interrelate. We cannot survive unless we have animals and unless we also take care of our environment. By the way, people are taken the way they treat the animals. Why am I saying this? When you do not provide the five freedoms that my colleague talked about, then it is 
quickly means that you cannot get the maximum view yeah, that you want from these particular animals. And number two, when you do not treat animals properly, don't be surprised when also humans start treating their feral colleagues the way they just treat the animals. Therefore, the way we relate to animals and the way we take care of animals, it is extremely important. For example, at the Brook, we work with equines, and you will actually realize that how important these animals are, for example, the donkeys in arid and semi-arid areas, the way women, for example, treat donkeys is slightly different from the way young boys treat donkeys. Women will handle donkeys comfortably, and they will be able to get the maximum they can from them. And then vis-a-vis, -vis, when you look at the young boys, when they take the, the drugs, for example, they start mistreating these animals. And thereafter, you find that these animals, either they die on the street, they don't get any output out of them, and quickly they spend too much money on treating these particular animals. And therefore, the animals also become very aggressive, and the humans also become very aggressive thereafter you start hearing that uh, the boys out there in the town, those who work for the donkeys, for example, they have started killing people. And even the chicken that we eat, I wish, how I wish that uh, the mind that we are hearing all this can touch our hearts, and then we start doing what we are talking about, taking care of our animals so that the animals can also take care of us. I therefore ask everybody to join us to take good care of our animals. That is the welfare we are talking about. Thank you. All right, take good care of our animals. I want to turn the focus now to our live audience, which comprises of professionals as well as students. Are there any students in the house? Can I get a, oh yeah? Can you wave to the audience back at home? All right, to our professionals, you are also much welcome to shoot any questions. At this juncture, I'd like to just take two questions, Sharon. Yep. Then we can perhaps get some input from our panelists. Any questions? Just raise up your hand. We have a question at the back here. Any other question? OK. Gentlemen, just introduce yourself and make it one brief, quick question. Thank you. My name is Dominic, a student from the University of Nairobi. I have a question directed to the uh, representative in the State Department. Uh, good animal welfare depends on the av availability of veterinary services. Uh, we have the veterinary services right now is under the State Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Livestock, but which is in direct violation of the 2010 Constitution, which put places the veterinary services under health services. So why is that? And my other question is kindly, uh, you inform us on the progress of the animal uh, animal disaster management in the county level and the national level. Thank you. Thank you, sir. One more question from a lady. Yes, we have one question here. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Margaret Oteno from the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya. Um, our panelists. Uh, given that uh, obviously animal welfare is very, very important, and uh, especially the relationship between the economy and animal welfare. I'm wondering how much uh, the veterinary department was uh, um, involved in the preparation of the CBC uh, for primary school, secondary school, and at the university and colleges level. Thank you very much. All right, Sharon, over to you now. Right, I think uh, we can start with those questions, and they're directly to you, uh, Dr. Maguero. Thank, Thank you very much. I think it's... Uh, yeah. The first question was on the issue of the veterinary services in the national and the county government. Since the services were devolved, that doesn't mean that uh, um, there are no services being offered. The county governments have employed some vets, and also the personnel, the paraprofessionals, that is the veterinary paraprofessionals. I know that uh, they are still not found in each and every location in the country like before, but I do believe that the county governments are doing what they can so that they can populate the country with the veterinary services that uh, is available. And also, don't forget that we have the 
private veterinarians. Now, there are various private veterinary clinics around the country, and those are also offering veterinary services to the, uh, uh, to the population and to the, to, the, uh, to the farmers. Now, when it comes to the issue of education, it's very, very, um, I mean, we are very happy to inform you that uh, our government was very, very uh, involved, was uh, very, very concerned on the issue of animal welfare. And you realize that animal welfare is something that is supposed to be inculcated into humans right from when they are growing up. And therefore, the, um, the present uh, school curriculum that we have, the new one, which is the competency-based curriculum, has actually infused the issues of animal welfare into that curriculum. And therefore, in our new curriculum, we'll be educating the children right from primary up to, right now we still have it up to the upper primary, and we'll still move up, up to the secondary level. Now, when it comes to the university, the universities, through the regulation of the Kenya Veterinary Board, their curriculum has included the issues of animal welfare in the curriculum of the universities and also the middle-level colleges that are training the veterinary professionals and the veterinarians. You realize that in this country, we only have two, two universities that are training veterinarians. It's, it's really a very difficult course also just to start or rather to, to put in a college. So those two colleges, that is the University of Nairobi and Egerton University that are training uh, veterinarians, have animal welfare component in their curriculum. Now the middle level colleges, that uh, the animal health colleges, the colleges that are training animal health and production in that curriculum, they also include animal welfare, and they are all being regulated by the Kenya Veterinary Board. So we do believe that in the near future, most of our young people will have the concepts of animal welfare inculcated into them, and therefore our animals will be well taken care of when it comes to welfare. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, you want to add on to that? Yes, I want to add, uh, because there, there is that uh, dimension that is being raised on animal health, and say that an welfare is beyond animal health. And if you think about animals as sentient uh, beings, they have the capability to feel emotions, they have the capability to feel pain, to form relationships, to uh, exhibit personalities. So from that aspect alone, it is, the, it is the responsibility of everyone who comes across an animal that you don't want to hurt that animal because it is a sentient being. So it is beyond animal health and if we can be able to raise uh, enough public awareness so that even my mother in the village or my brother or your brother or anybody is able to treat animal and in a way that you don't want to cause it negative emotions, just like you don't want to hurt another person. That alone is a motivation that everybody has a role, whether you have it nice services accessible to you or not, that is something that can be done even if where there are no veterinary services. Thank right, you. and uh, Mr. McIver, you... Yes. Okay. I, I think, <clears throat> I just want to pick on something that Dominic said, and I think it's important that we as Kenyans then make some hard decisions, especially now that uh, they talk around reviewing our constitution. I think what Dominic is raising is pertinent, because the way the constitution is structured, and in, uh, veterinary services seems to be in two spaces, mm -hmm. and that is giving us a challenge. If you look at uh, the responsibilities of the counties, the first part of it talks about uh, counties are responsible for disease control, which is veterinary services. But if you look at the second bulletin or the third bulletin, it talks about county health services, including veterinary services, excluding regulation. So there's confusion whether at the county level, whether veterinary services should be actually be under Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries, or should be under County Health Services, which is Ministry of Health. And I think recent proposals were when uh, Kenya Veterinary Board and Veterinary Association made presentations to the, the BBI team that is looking at the, uh, revising the Constitution, was that we need to create an animal health 
um, commission mm. that then handles both veterinary services and uh, medical services. As an independent Yeah, uh, as, as, as together. Because I think part of where we are going wrong as a country is that we have placed veterinary services outside there and we are concentrating on treatment. But if you look at where we are talking about country, county health services, part of it is primary, primary health care. And primary health care is about how you manage your food systems, how you manage what ends up in your, on your plate. And so we are looking at preventive medicine instead of, uh, we are looking at curative medicine in this country instead of preventive medicine. And I think it's something that where Dominic is right, we need to quickly resolve and determine where we are going to put veterinary services. Is it part of agriculture and livestock or is it part of health services? And then address the issues around that. I think part of the challenge why we are not having And is that enough, an ongoing conversation? It's an ongoing con conversation, but I think this conversation needs to go to the county level where you and I sit because I think part of the failure is we are not holding our county responsible. So while they're willing to put money in infrastructure or starting something else, they're not readily putting money into veterinary services that is critical for the, to ensure that we have good welfare that leads to be better food or better nutrition for the human population, which is something around the Big Four agenda. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Big Four agenda, you're talking about healthy populations as part of what you're looking at. But how will you have healthy population if 45 to 50, 55 percent of the food comes from animal populations that are not being looked at and regulated? Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that we need to address mm -hmm. as a country. I think that, that answers uh, your question. And uh, OK. Maybe just to add on to that, sorry, I, I forgot that part of the question. You realize that about 70 to 80 percent of microorganisms are actually shared between animals and humans. And because anim humans interact very closely with the animals, that, uh, the, 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 the diseases are passed across between animals and humans. And so there's, the, this particular group of diseases that we call zoonotic diseases are uh, very, very key when it comes to the health of the, of the humans and also vice versa. And because of that, we have a concept on One Health. And with the One Health concept, the, the Directorate of Veterinary Services and the Ministry of Health work very closely, uh, very closely together to tackle such kind of diseases. And those committees are up to the county level. And that's why you, the, veterinary, the veterinary services are both in health and in agriculture. Right. Um, Mr. McIver, your organization is involved uh, in the advocacy of the one uh, protection of animals on a global scale. From where you sit, what does the global animal welfare landscape look like in the, into the next decade? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I have the, the privilege of traveling you know, around the world and uh, seeing the situation firsthand, you know, observing uh, the conditions for animals, the treatment of animals. Um, and I have to tell you, that picture it is a grim picture. Um, I mean, often we think that there are many parts of the world where animal welfare is high on the agenda. And that may be true, um, but nevertheless, animals in so many cases are treated as little more than commodities. Um, and they are really neglected, they're not thought about when it comes to the protection of, of their habitats, for instance. So I'll give a couple of examples. You know, I was in uh, China uh, two weeks ago, and I was fortunate enough to go out to a nature reserve on the edge of Beijing. Um, and in that nature reserve, there were a series of gravestones. They stretched out in front of me, and as I walked along those gravestones and looked at the names on them, they were actually the species of animals that have been lost to the world. Uh, and I can tell you that even in the time that we watch and engage with this program, we will have lost at least another half dozen species from our planet. So if we value animals, we're not doing a good job at protecting them. Uh, and protecting the, the, the diversity of them. But what happens to some of those animals? Um, it's not just their extinction, but very often they're taken from wild places. They're taken out of uh, places like the Amazon, 
where we're seeing an incredible rate of destruction through the deliberate burning of those forests uh, to create land uh, to either rear cattle uh, or to uh, produce grain, cereal crops that are not being fed to you or to me. They're being shipped around the world and fed to animals in industrial farms. Um, so people are not benefiting locally, uh, and animals are certainly not benefiting. Our planet is not benefiting. And as a result of that, we are losing species of animals. Um, but in many cases, not only are those animals being lost, but many of them are being taken from the wild. As the forest is burnt back, uh, animals such as um, sloths, for instance, are uh, taken out of the wild and then used in the entertainment business. So many of us and people you know, watching this program will celebrate wildlife. This is a country in Kenya that is fortunate to be home to so many wonderful uh, animals. But what we don't understand is that, that many of these animals are taken and, and put into enclosed conditions. They're put on concrete, they're put in cages. In the case of elephants, young elephants are broken through a process called the crush where they're unable to eat or drink and they're kept on their feet uh, and beaten in order to allow people as tourists to ride on the backs of those magnificent animals. That's what we're doing to our wildlife. We're, we're, we're losing those species, we're failing to protect them, and then we're using them uh, for entertainment. If I just focus on one other area, an area that affects all of us, which is the farming of animals, you saw in the film uh, earlier um, pictures inside an industrial shed. There's a shed filled with uh, broiler chickens, meat chickens, that are being reared in the most unnatural conditions. Um, and of course, we know that, that we need to feed people. Um, but the way that industrial farming has developed out of the United States into Europe and now into places like uh, China and is, uh, and is of course coming into, uh, into Africa, through South Africa and into Kenya, is unacceptable. Um, you know, we talked earlier, Victor, and everyone talked about the five freedoms. I can assure you I've been inside industrial pig farms and chicken farms where those animals have no freedoms. There is no ability to move freely around. There is no, no escape from you know, suffering, leg deformities, wing breaks. Um, there is no natural light. They have short, brutish lives to produce uh, cheap food. And I think the challenge for Kenya, and I love the title of this series, Transform Kenya, I think the challenge for Kenya and the opportunity is that this country could take a different route, instead of going down the same route and, and concrete and metal industrialization, it could choose to you know, raise the standards for small holders uh, to protect welfare, and it could avoid the worst excesses of industrial farming, and that's what I hope uh, Kenya will do. Right. Uh, and maybe just to stay with you for uh, very briefly, uh, because it's very sad to hear that in the next decade, in your view, uh, the picture looks grim. We have organizations such as yours uh, engaged in creating awareness and talking about why it's important. We have anti-poaching agencies in our country, in many countries. So what is the gap? What, why are we not getting better? Why is the welfare, why is the picture not getting better? Well, you know, as, as people, Ask, ask someone a question. Um, they'll give you the answer that they think you want to hear or which they think is right. They'll tell you, yeah, of course we love animals. Um, of course we wouldn't be cruel. Um, but then they go and do exactly the opposite, um, often because they don't know it's cruel. Uh, so take, you know, elephant riding, for instance, um, or the purchase of some food product. They don't know what happens in the production system. So. One, it's about our behavior as people. If we really believe that we care about sentient animals, animals such as a pig, for instance, which has a very similar level of uh, awareness and intelligence as a dog, which has a very similar level of awareness and intelligence as a three-year-old child, if we care about that, then we should be making choices in the things that we buy, mm -hmm. um, making sure we find out how things are produced. But also, we have to hold our our policymakers to account. 
Often we're very good, and governments are very good at putting policies in. They're not so good at enforcing those policies, you know, making sure that we live up to those standards. And I think that's a challenge here in Kenya mm -hmm. uh, and in many other countries around the world. Uh, and I guess, um, you know, those are, those are the main things. I think the, the final thing is, uh, apart from government, which, you know, in many cases is, is doing good work, um, uh, we need to put pressure on, on industry, on, on business, mm. um, because very often business can lead on issues that involve ethics, and they can offer consumers uh, a, a good choice in the products that they buy. So uh, that's, that's the gap for me. The gap right. is between you know, what people think or what governments often pass as policy or, or companies do and what they actually do and what they mean. Luckily, Dr. Magera is sitting right, <laughs> right next to you when you're talking about policy and, <laughs> and the implementation. So we, we know about the policies which you talked about when we started, and uh, there are other regulations as well. Maybe this implementation story, which seems to be the problem in any other sector, that we have good principles, what do you have to say? It's true. It's true. Um, enforcement of laws, and you all know enforcement of laws in our country, even just the traffic laws that we, we are always in those vehicles and driving. How much are we enforcing? We are waiting for NTSA to be on the road and the police before we are able to do the right thing. It's the same thing with the, with the policy. We actually have very good regulations in this country. For example, when it comes to the veterinary services, we have almost about 20 laws that talks about animal diseases, talks about on how you are supposed to clean your animals and uh, how you are supposed to transport your animals. Prevention to Cruelty Act, yeah? That says that you are supposed to know to, uh, even scare an animal is an offense in this country, which most of us do, and, <laughs> and we don't realize. And when we look at the penal code, there are several sections that touch on issues of animal cruelty. Because even just stealing an animal and killing it for the sake of getting that hide or, uh, or, or, um, or meat from it, the way we are seeing the bush slaughter is happening, is actually an offense and can put you in for like 14 years. And we don't realize that. And uh, even if you just infect an animal through the penal code, you infect an animal with infectious disease, for example, knowingly, you can be put in for about three years. But the question is, how much do you as a person want to, uh, uh, want to, uh, to implement? Because when it comes to issues of animals, it's just like children. By the time the enforcer or, or the law enforcement person comes in, there's no evidence, isn't it? And that's why in CAP 360, that is the Prevention to Cruelty to Animals Act, gives all of us the mandate to report animal cruelty. Instead of waiting for um, Dr. Magero to come and take you to court, your neighbor should be able to be the watchman over you so that you, he can be able to take you to court. And that's why when it was being done in the 80s, unfortunately, uh, the fines are still very, are, are very low as, as to now, but it was very high then. In the 80s, the fines were like 3,000 shillings, and that was a lot of money. And the law says that if you report cruelty to animals, and that person has be, is, is convicted to a certain fine, then the magistrate can give you up to half of the fine uh, uh, that is in, uh, put into that, I mean, that is meted to, on that person. So that law was put to encourage people to report. But that shows that the government is so committed and wants you also to help us to enforce that law. Okay? So that is uh, <laughs> how it is. All right. You know, you are the face of government here tonight, so all the policy <laughs> questions we have are directed to you. And um, Dr. Kimani, let's talk about the nexus between uh, the welfare and well-being of animals and the environment. How do these two come together? Why is it, how are they connected? Thank you. There is a link between animal welfare and the environment. Because when, you, when an animal is stressed, it releases stress hormones. And it has been found that when an, animals are, when an animal is stressed, it does release more methane, which is associated with greenhouse emissions. So if, if you have you know, stressed animals or animals in bad welfare state, 
it has a negative impact on the environment. And the reverse is true. If you have healthy and happy animals, they, they, they emit less methane, so they pollute the environment less. All right. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Amo, uh, maybe to add to that on, on, on matters environment, and also then move on to talk to us about food safety, which is very close, uh, closely related with the welfare of, of animals. Uh, thank you, Sharon. I, I, I will not add much on to the environment because I think uh, Tabitha has handled it relatively well. But I think one of the things we need to be looking at is the link between food safety and animal welfare. Mm. And earlier on when we were talking about the five freedoms, we were very clear and elaborated the fact that animals that are in an uncomfortable environment, and let me just cut it down so that we understand what we mean. If you look at our production system, mm. Kenya, this region, East Africa for that matter, a lot of our challenges with disease control is poor hygiene and a poor biosecurity system and a poor environment, which means, uh, and part of it is the, 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 the thought about uh, cutting costs. So you find farmers in a chicken house will have three weeks old chickens on one side and maybe one week old chickens on the other side. The farmer is trying to keep a market. But the reality is that the three weeks chicks are affecting the one week old chicks mm -hmm. and transmitting diseases, whether through live vaccines that have been put in the system, or because the farmer can't even wash the house, there's high levels of contamination mm -hmm. with disease causing organisms. And what then tends to happen is a farmer then has learned, especially in this, uh, this region, farmers have learned that we can actually put antibiotics in the name of curative, uh, preventive. Yeah? What farmers don't realize is that that antibiotic that you put at low dose is actually going to end up on your table and is going to have a negative impact on your health because it leads to antimicrobial resistance and diseases, and you've had in this country, we have diseases that cannot be treated with any known antibiotics. The harsh reality is that, and it's estimated that close to 50, 60 percent of the antibiotics that we put in uh, production systems are not necessary. Mm. Yeah. It's just masking the poor animal welfare, uh, that's why we are putting it in there, but we're also failing to connect with the fact that it will end up on our table, and it means that when we consume it at that, that sub, sub clinical doses, mm -hmm. we'll end up with DC, uh, selecting organisms, and we'll end up with situations where we can't be treated, and it's estimated in another 10, 15 years, we'll have a million of us dying annually on this continent because of diseases that cannot be treated. And so that's part of the reason why we need to be very clear and drive the agenda around animal welfare. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you look at, for instance, uh, the other thing which we can look at, which is very interesting, again, happens in this region. When you have poor maize, when uh, maize gets rotten at the cereal board, what do we do with it? We feed it on animals. Why are we feeding? When we feed it on animals, what happens? The maize has toxins. Mm. That toxin is concentrated. It comes out in milk. It comes out in the eggs. It comes out in the meat. And you end up with a population that is having depressed growth rates, it's having de uh, depressed immune systems because we're actually eating toxins at lower levels. Mm. And so I think part of what we need to be asking ourselves is how we, do we drive this agenda yeah. so that the relevant government authorities, and I think media has done very well. Every time I, I look at newspapers, I find antibiotics, reports of antibiotics in milk, reports of antibiotics in food, we find mycotoxins, but who's talking about why is it there and where do, then do we push county governments, which are responsible for husbandry, mm -hmm. to drive that agenda to ensure that farmers are doing the right thing mm -hmm. so that antibiotics are not being used to mask production that farmers are doing the right thing. In fact, at certain levels, it's the same leadership that then quickly says when maize is rotten that we should put mm -hmm. it to feed systems. Mm -hmm. And so we need to engage our leadership and engage the whole system to ensure that whatever we give to that animal right. is actually good for human consumption and ends up with a wholesome, safe product mm -hmm. that is not going to give us challenges. Just and, to conclude, so uh, that, because I know we need to move on, I don't know how many of us realize that early this year, one of our big producers in milk actually changed how they buy milk. They moved away from buying milk in volumes and started saying they are going to buy milk on quantity, quality. And part of their quality requirements is that the, uh, the, the, the milk should not have no antibiotics. It's also a requirement that it should not have any additives, especially mm -hmm. water, because mm -hmm. part of us expand milk using water. And all these are connected to the fact that consumers are beginning to demand for certain things. 
And part of those things, and that's why we talk from a farming perspective to consumers and to the general public, is for you to start asking certain questions. If the big producer is already saying we cannot buy milk unless it's clear of antibiotics, mm -hmm. there's something they know that we are ruining our markets, and mm -hmm. there's something they know that we need to be doing to avoid milk right. with antibiotics. And that's part of the discussion that we need to be having, and that's part of raising awareness that we do as an organization to bring consumers into the conversation. And as Steve said, that is why we want you to make buying decisions based on understanding the value chain around which you're purchasing your food from. And speaking about uh, buying decisions, you launched a report recently as uh, World Animal Protection, yeah. which shows that consumers are getting more and more uh, sensitive to these issues. You know, they want to get meat that they know has been produced without the antibiotics. They also care about how the animals were handled. Yeah. So is, but is there a traceability system so that I know, uh, you know, maybe farm A produces in this manner so that I know this meat goes here? The, again, a very good question. Yeah, uh, two or three weeks back, we produced a report that was looking at the knowledge attitudes and practices that consumers do around buying their uh, meats. Two interesting things came out of that product, uh, that piece of research. One is that a good chunk of us as consumers buy our meats from a butchery, mm. not a supermarket. But when we ask the question, do you trust, which source of information do you trust? the second most mistrusted source of information was the butchery. So what we are saying as Kenyans and from the four countries is that we buy our meat from a source that we don't trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the yeah, uh, contradiction the at that level, the irony at that level. But going beyond that, consumers are also beginning and it, the, the, the percentages were, different, were slightly different from country to country because it was in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania and Zambia. And the Kenyan population, because I think we've been here long enough and it's a narrative that we've discussed long enough, had higher percentages of people saying that one, they understand that there's a connection between antibiotics in food and the level how animals are raised. Mm. And two, a good chunk of us also understand that there's a connection between that antibiotic and the impact on my health. What we need you to go is go beyond that and start saying, if you understand those connections, why then are we mm. buying through that process? We need to then shift and use our, our buying power to force industry to do certain things that then drives the narrative uh, and ensures that we have wholesome products that come into the, into our, onto our plate. Mm -hmm. But you asked a very good question. Can we track? Yeah, and I think one of the things I will say confidently is that there are tracking systems that are available. There are traceability systems that are available. And those are some of the standards that we are trying to develop with the industry, working with both the poultry and pig industry. A lot of us see one of the big producers in this country talking about from farm to fork. Yeah. And what we fail to understand is that from farm to fork is actually a traceability standard. And I want to challenge us. If you, know the, if, if you go to that producer, if you pro picked any chicken from any supermarket anywhere, a, a food fast food restaurant, a supermarket, or wherever it's from, mm. you should be able to call them and ask them which truck carried that chicken. Mm. Which feed did it eat? Where were, it, were this feed, was it made from a maize diet or was it made from an alternative diet? That is what traceability is right. all about. And the country is trying to put together tra traceability systems that you and I can then engage with. Mm. But the ba basic place where we need to start as good Kenyans is to start asking the source, whether it's a supermarket, right. whether it's a butcher, what process And be more that concerned animal, with what we're actually yeah. taking. It's just like when you're buying your vehicle, you actually ask about fuel, mileage, spare wheels, etc. Are the spare parts available? Mm. But when it comes to food, we're a bit lax. We don't ask. We actually buy our food from a source we don't trust. Mm. There's something that we need to do there as Kenyans. Right. I think, Steve, you wanted to add something to that? I was going to make just a, a quick point, um, again, looking at it from outside Kenya. And it, it was interesting, over the last couple of days, we've been talking about, and I've been learning about, you know, um, what's going on within in Kenya and the you know, agriculture and uh, obviously the growth that we're seeing in um, the production of, uh, you know, meat, uh, animal protein, um, in different parts of the continent as well. Um, and that's understandable. Um, but I think what's interesting when you look outside, when you go into um, uh, the US, or you look at countries like the UK, Germany, 
actually, we're starting to go the other way. Um, and people um, have got to very high levels of, of meat consumption. And, you know, both uh, individuals from a health point of view, um, the environment, um, you know, uh, and animals um, have suffered as a result of that. And we've seen uh, issues because of antimicrobial resistance. We've seen issues because of obesity. Um, we certainly got strong uh, connections, relationships between eating too much of the wrong meat and, and cancer and other uh, diseases. And so, you know, we're actually seeing a real shift, especially among the younger generations, um, away uh, mm. from uh, eating so much meat and towards plant power uh, and bringing plants back in, which are, of course, we have to remember, incredibly efficient. You know, if you compare uh, the amount of protein that you can get um, by eating plants directly compared to, um, you know, beef cattle, for instance, you know, it, it's 20 times as efficient to just eat the, 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 the grain, if you like. So, again, I would say, you know, learn, learn some stuff perhaps uh, from, from where others have done well on welfare, but also where we've gone very wrong. Right. Dr. Tabitha. One thing that can uh, improve the markets uh, and traceability of food is labeling of uh, food in the supermarkets or whatever it is. Because if you look at our, if you go to the any shelves in the supermarket, what you are likely to see is the name of the company, where the product comes from. But what is the specifics about that, uh, that product? There isn't much information to guide the consumers. And it is very difficult to, as a consumer, to go to the shelf. You know, you can't ask every question that, where did this come from? That information should be available. And probably we should have a system where if I buy something from the supermarket, I can just pick up some information, key in that information to a mobile app and be able to get information about that product. We, maybe we are far from that. But we do have in developed countries uh, rebuild products. If they are antibiotics free, they are rebuild that this is an antibiotic free product. So the same thing with the products that come from farms that have complied with animal welfare. So you will get those products that are properly rebuild. So that's one of the systems that probably we need to be thinking going into the future. And where would this fall as a, as a policy recommendation? Uh, Department of Industry, where would, well, because it's important when we make such recommendations, we know where we can we can throw it to. It's it's a it's 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 both a, an agriculture prob, uh, issue. It's also because it's a food safety issue. It's also about the public health. The Ministry of Health and the other stakeholders right. needs to specify that when you place something in the shelf, you need to give in A, B, C, D information about that product so that the consumer can make an informed decision mm -hmm. when you're choosing between this product and the other product. Right. Dr. Maguero. Thank you very much. And uh, the government is alive to the same issues that they've mm -hmm. talked about. And right now we are reviewing the veterinary public health laws. And... Uh, the draft is already out, and it's being dis discussed at the, by other stakeholders. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a whole section on traceability of animal products. That is uh, what they are talking about. So mm. we hope that uh, this time you will be able to enforce <laughs> the traceability laws that are going to come out. <laughs> right. I think, Abby, we can take uh, some feedback just to know how this conversation is continuing outside of this room. Some feedback both from social media and from the audience, live audience. All right, Sharon, quite uh, illuminating discussions there, very rich and cogent points being raised by the panelists. And uh, allow me to just stick some questions on our social media platforms. Uh, right now, I can see, Sharon, we're actually trending at number two in the country. It means there's a lot of feedback happening. There's a tweet here from John Mtua saying that uh, Africa is a treasure chest of biodiversity, but its wildlife is in great danger. And uh, of course, Sharon, this is one of the aspects that has been actually raised by our very able community on social media. Another question here coming in from, um, let me just quickly scroll. Another question here from Duke saying, what role does the government or non-governmental organizations 
uh, do to protect the welfare of animals, especially at county level, in reference to outdated cultural beliefs that mistreat animals in the name of providing cheap labor? This is Duke Oeba. And uh, let me also open it up, Sharon, to our live audience to just also ask maybe a question or two. Right. Any quick questions? All right, we have a gentleman here at the front, just to make it brief because of time. Um, thank you very much. My name is Kahinde Lekalaile. I work at African Network for Animal Welfare. Um, I believe the government is the, is the biggest driver of apathy towards animal welfare in the country. I've just come from Rwanda right now to attend the Poultry Africa Conference. Europe and America has already banned caged farming. Our own government is encouraging it. How is that possible? How can we actually embrace technology that has already been rejected in Europe and the biggest investors in Rwanda were European investors selling caged and cages for chicken farming in Africa. They were actually the most in that forum. Number two, just to finish on this, a caged chicken grows in a 30 by 30 centimeter space. In order for you to keep it alive, you pump in antibiotics. They go into your meat and go into your eggs. How can we as a government be encouraging our women in the name of poverty alleviation to adopt cages, our youth in the name of youth employment to adopt cages instead of actually embracing technology that actually improves public health and um, addresses the consumer needs at the same time? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Magera, I can see you're being put on the spot a bit. But uh, your fellow panelists will also be able to respond. And uh, we have another question here, Sharon, from one of the other key participants this evening. And uh, let me just quickly get to him to just get his quick question before we throw it back to the panelists. Thank you. I think Dr. Magero mentioned the uh, credit law. That law presupposes that credit exists. At what point do we need to have a law that is animal-based, which we are talking about the quality of the standards, rather than punishing human action in regard to cruelty? Because I think we have a law that doesn't talk about preventing cruelty, but a law that talks about animal welfare standards. I think we need to shift that, because that law presupposes that we already have cruelty. And the other point that I want to clarify from, and that is also from you, is the issue of, 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 of the Constitution. And I think uh, in regard to the functions, both at the county level and then the national level. Once we say, I think in Section one, Article 185, 186, 187, about the issues of the functions of each of the governments. And the functions of one more warfare control is with the county. But if you look at part one of that schedule four, part 22, it talks about animal protection. Now, the question is, do these functions fall under either of the governments, or is it a concurrent uh, uh, jurisdiction that we need to have a working between both governments? I think that if we get that right, then some of the problems that we're talking about is we are going to do. Because if everybody has to do it, then nobody will do it. And we need to know where responsibility lies. All right. One last burning question. One last one. I think let's just take them because we're about to go on a break. And then when we come back, Fantastic. we'll be addressing them. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So you just shoot your question, but it will be answered later on. So my name is Trish Sewe. I work with Wildlife Direct. And uh, my question probably goes to Dr. Yamo on awareness. Uh, we as uh, an organization have realized that the country, we have people or citizens who are not empowered to act on issues that we see. So see something, do something. It's usually see something, say something. And you can look at the tweets right now. There's lots of photos of chicken being carried on um, motorbikes 
on matatus. Our roads have cameras and the police are on the road. Have those um, kinds of cruelty we are witnessing every day being stopped? Do the police know that this is something they should do? Do we as Kenyans know that if I see something, who do I report it to? What level of awareness is going down to the local Monainchi? Because in here, we may be elite enough to know that I'm concerned about the antibiotic that's going into my meat, but the mamamboga and the people at the butchery level, and those of us who we send to buy our meat, maybe you've sent the house girl or somebody else, how do we ensure that these people are empowered enough so that we can all speak and it's not just a small group? Uh, Sharon, I mean a lot of questions coming through, limited time. But uh, Sharon, do we take uh, one last one? Or I we think there are hands behind there. We can take them. Okay. Let's just take what is. Let me take uh, this gentleman quickly. I'm Gabriel Guyot from the University of Nairobi. My question is directed to Dr. Victor. Uh, we've had several petitions online and we've signed them concerning, like, uh, for instance, compelling the county government to vaccinate dogs against rabies rather than kill them, and uh, the issue of the African parrot that is being poached. So far, where are we with the petition and what have we achieved? Very impressive questions. Sorry, that's, that's directed to? Dr. Yamo. OK. OK. Last one, Sharon? Let, let's just take them. Up. All right. Yeah. One last quick question here. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Samuel Theuri. Uh, my name is Samuel Theuri. I work for the Brook East Africa, which is uh, an, an equine welfare charity. Steve gave a fair assessment of who we are as a people, that if, and I repeat, if we value our animals, we are not doing justice to protect them. And uh, this is in reference to the ongoing mass slaughter of donkeys in this continent, and Kenya in particular, where donkeys are being smuggled also into the country for slaughter from our neighboring countries. My question is, is the government aware of this mass slaughter that is happening? And what is it doing to regulate or control it, if not ban it? All right. We still have a minute, so we can take uh, one more quick one. OK, one here. My name is Chris Tucker from FarmVet Africa. My question is, if I fell sick today, it would be so hard for me to access certain antibiotics, actually so many drugs. But why is it that it sounds so easy to accept all these, uh, to access all these antibiotics um, that are given to animals, like it's candy? And this question is directed to the government, Dr. John. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Dr. Magero, you are literally on the hot seat tonight, but you have enough capacity to respond to these questions. Sharon, let me close the questions at that juncture. Okay. Perhaps we can get some reactions from the panelists. Um, I don't know if we can take that before we go on break. Okay, so let's start with that last question that was directed to the government <laughs> <laughs> on the accessibility of antibiotics. Thank you very much, and uh, it's good you are talking about the government, and I would ask you, who is the government? <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget it's you and I. However, <laughs> you realize that uh, previously, the veterinary drugs in this country were being regulated by the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. And if you can recall, every time they would go out, they would close pharmacies, yeah? They would close those pharmacies and uh, other human drug outlets, but they would never touch the agrovets. And that's why now we have a regulator for, um, for veterinary drugs called the Veterinary Medicines Direct, um, Directorate. Yeah? And we hope that that, we, not that we hope, they, they are building capacity, and uh, in future it will be very difficult for you to uh, get hold of a of our part one poison, that is the antibiotics and the, the drugs that are meant to, to be only used at prescription. So we hope 
that uh, by the time all the capacity is done, all of you will be aware and you'll be your neighbor's keeper. So, is that? Yeah, yeah I think we can, we can take your next question. The next Before, one on the donkey. Oh, yes, on the donkey. Are you aware of the mass killings? Yes. Now, the, you realize that uh, the donkey issues has, uh, have really been uh, highlighted in this country, and uh, as Kenya, we are really at a, uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at a fix, especially when it is alleged that we import donkeys to slaughter. If you look at the dynamics of our animal movements within Eastern Africa, most of the borders of, our, of these countries are very porous. So you are not likely, even, in fact, even cattle, all, most of the cattle that we eat and sheep and goats are from the neighboring countries, though they don't come in as imports. And that is because of the porous borders. You, you find that the, uh, one, one family is in both, it is, in, in, is in two countries at the same time. So when this movement of the donkeys are coming in, we are not likely to know whether they are imported or not. However, since we started slaughtering, the, um, we started getting, uh, I mean, licensing the donkey slaughterhouses. You recall that several times some of them have been closed down and they have not been uh, operational due to one reason or another, and that shows that the government is very keen that the donkeys are slaughtered in a humane, in a humane way. And, uh, and, uh, Mm, I think that is okay. So, yeah, so yeah. that you are aware. And we'll come we back. Uh, we want to take a short break now. Uh, maybe we'll be noting the questions uh, even during the break. And when we come back, we can address the other questions okay. uh, that were raised. But uh, we want to take a short break now here on Transform Kenya. But don't go too far. This conversation continues shortly. As a platform for the voices of society, the Standard Group, in partnership with World Animal Protection, will host the Transform Kenya Forum to discuss and create awareness on the welfare and protection of animals in Kenya. Join our panel as they discuss animal welfare live from Desmond Tutu Conference Hall, Waiyaki Way. Follow the conversation on our social media platforms to share how we can ensure sustainable utilization of animals in a world where they live free from cruelty and suffering. Transform Kenya. This is KTN News. A bank or two, Barasa and Yuja. Achivia, go to get an ambassador, Beza, or get an organizer, a bubble, the Athenian, when you say number, go and see the fresh. They are young and tired, forced to work for more than sixteen hours a day. Some are left to die in search of employment. Children who are forced to sacrifice education for work. They're being mistreated, they've been paid very low wages, and they find these young girls there, they sexually molest them. They are the invisible modern slaves of the society. People or governments just go to the market to buy poverty. KTN News investigative journalist Hussein Mohammed explores the world of child trafficking in today's slave trade. This is the price of child labor. This is servitude. episode of Daring Abroad comes to you from the Edith Cowan University in Perth City, Australia. And guess who? It's been great to be sincere. I've liked ECU. I've enjoyed my life as a student here. First semester, I was given an opportunity to be the athletic captain. Alfred Koech, and this is a production of Chums Media Limited for both KTN News and KTN Home this Saturday at 9.45 p.m. Sharing of the money is constitutional. It is not out of benevolence. The difference between 216, uh, 316 and 
327 billion is a matter of 10 billion. Why can't they meet halfway? The Constitution is supposed to protect each and every one of us, but right now it's protecting those who have the deepest pockets. Let us learn one thing, that if he's going to become president, he must deal with rhinophobia. I'm very much eager to see what BDI will also bring on board, plus everyone else, so that we have a, a more uh, national debate. Unless we begin demanding for issue-based politics, mm -hmm. we will continue to be divided along um, hustlers versus dynasties. As a musician, I need the radio station more than the radio station needs me. KTN Prime Highlights in association with KCB Elimisha. Starehe Girls Center now closed temporarily as the number of learners infected by an unknown contagious disease rises to 80. At least one person killed after the walls of a construction site collapsed in Kakamega in the latest case of building disasters in the country. Kenyans angered by a public announcement by the Kenya Railways banning passengers from carrying their own food and drinks into the standard gauge railway. Also tonight, we tell you the ugly side of sand mining that has left one village in Karachonyo sub-location in Homer Bay County in virtual darkness. It may be the best job in the world, but definitely not the easiest. We love them to bits. <laughs> we do. But it gets harder and harder to make do. Life with its twists and turns. KCB Elimisha is what it takes. KCB, go ahead. KTN News. Get the whole story. As a platform for the voices of society, the Standard Group, in partnership with World Animal Protection, will host the Transform Kenya Forum to discuss and create awareness on the welfare and protection of animals in Kenya. Join our panel as they discuss animal welfare live from Desmond Tutu Conference Hall, Waiaki Way. Follow the conversation on our social media platforms to share how we can ensure sustainable utilization of animals in a world where they live free from cruelty and suffering. Transform Kenya. And thank you so much for staying with Transform Kenya. We are coming to you live from the Desmond Tutu Conference Hall here in Westlands, Nairobi. And tonight, our focus is on animal protection and welfare here in Kenya. Now, before we went on break, we took some questions from our audience here uh, in the hall. And there's that question about how easy it is to access antibiotics for animals and drugs in general. And Dr. Tabitha, this is also something that you, your organization is involved in. Yes. Uh the agenda of antimicrobial resistance is something that has been raised to the highest level of the United Nations uh, General Assembly. And so each of the countries is expected to develop their national action plan. I'm happy to report that Kenya launched their national action plan in 2017. We worked with them. And right now, we have been able to review legislations with the, with the government so that we can be able to identify what are some of these loopholes that are causing the, the, the unlimited access of animal, animal antibiotics by the public. And so in the next phase of our project, we will be assisting the government to update the legislation so that some of these gaps can be addressed so that now uh, the, the, the access to uh, antibiotics can be ensured where it is required, but the you know the misuse and overuse is is is, is addressed. So that is what we will be right. doing in the next uh, maybe one year or so. Right. And Dr. Amo, there are two questions uh, directed to you on the petitions that have been getting signed online, and then there's a question of awareness down to the Monanchi level. How much are we doing? Okay, uh, thank you for those questions. I'll start with the petition one. We as an organization have driven pet online petitions and we've, we must say we are very appreciative for those of you who've signed those petitions. 
The question was then, what has happened to them? I will start with the KFC one. I, I, two or three years back, we started a petition around getting K, K, KFC to do certain things uh, around chicken welfare, to raise welfare of the chickens that you then end up uh, consuming. We raised about one and a half million signatures across the world. Early this year, or late last year, early this year, we submitted those signatures to the headquarters of KFC out in the US. And the net effect is we've seen certain movements around the KFC franchises. The most important one, or the one I would like to highlight, is the fact that the KFC franchises in Europe have now signed what we know is known as better chicken commitment, which is essentially saying that they are going to look at welfare, the welfare of broiler chickens to ensure that the chickens have enough space, they are not uh, raised in a situation that uh, drives them to have poor welfare. I think that's a milestone because based on that, then we're able to drive the process around some of our KFC. And part of what we'll be doing into next year is to then to ask the African KFCs to follow suit, which then cut us and ensures that we have high welfare production systems, which can then bring a difference in the lives of the chickens that you and I then end up consuming. The second one was about the parrot one, which was done early this year, and it was actually geared towards ensuring that Turkish Airlines does not uh, carry uh, parrots from Africa, predominantly Congo, into Europe. And essentially what has happened is even before the petition was, we finalized the period around which the petition was supposed to be signed, uh, Turkish Airlines already called us to have a discussion around what needs to happen. And one of the things was immediately they put an embargo on carrying uh, live parrots on their flights. So that's progress, but it's not where we want it to be. So we are is, is still in engagement with uh, Turkish Airlines to ensure that they will not be carrying any parrots uh, out of Africa. And for those who are interested, you can actually go onto our website to find out more why uh, ensuring that parrots are not traded or moved around is very important and critical for the African continent. The last one which I want to talk about was the one that he asked about dogs signing petitions to ensure that dogs get free vaccination, that is still active. And the requirement of uh, eliminating rabies from uh, the African, from the globe by 2030 requires that we must vaccinate dog at least 70% of the dog populations against rabies. So part of what the organization has done with uh, other partners is to ensure that we progressively do the vaccination. But the challenge we've realized is that a lot of us cannot afford the vaccination, vaccine. So part of what we're asking is county governments to ensure that uh, vaccination is available. And just to make you understand it, to put it in, an, in a context, it is cheaper to vaccinate a dog. It will cost between a thousand, roughly around a thousand bob or slightly less. However, if somebody gets bitten by a rabid dog, to treat that person if the clinical signs have not come into play, it will cost, you need about five shots of uh, anti-rabies uh, uh, treatment uh, medication. And those five shots will cost you anything between six to 15,000 shillings a shot. So it makes economic sense, if you're talking about economics of welfare, to then vaccinate the dog and ensure that the dog's uh, fundamental requirements or needs are catered for and ensure that then we manage the dog populations, which are the big two pillars around our dog, pop uh, do dog work in Africa. Now to go to the other question about awareness, it's good. I think uh, the person who asked the question was spot on. Part of the challenge we are having is the a level of awareness within the law enforcement. The policemen understand about over speeding. They also understand very, uh, relatively well about certain things around certain pieces of legislation. Animal welfare legislation is not well understood. And part of what we are doing under the Director of Veterinary Services on a group that brings together all animal welfare organizations known as AWIC, Animal Welfare Action Kenya, is to then engage even police. And one of the things we've tried to do is to actually have a session with policemen while at Kiganjo mm -hmm. to then highlight some of these uh, pieces of legislation that they also need to enforce. Uh, Joanne actually 
elaborated and talked about the penal code to look at the prevention of cruelty to animals act that also cut us for some of these things. So part of it is just then raising awareness in uh, amongst our law enforcement as an organization. We've even had engagement with magistrates and judges to just then also re uh, uh, remind them that there are also pieces of legislation that they need to be uh, driving. But as John also said, part of raising awareness is what we're doing now. Part of raising awareness is also engaging the general public. Mm -hmm. Part of raising awareness is also having this live discussion so for, for us to then be aware that certain things happen. It was very interesting to look at the audience when Magero talked about CAP 316 having a provision where if you report cruelty, then you can actually be paid part of the fines. In fact, that's the only piece of legislation that puts money back into your pocket for reporting uh, 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 an offense. So I think it's that process. The other bit of it is the fact that we have then engaged the, educa the education system. Mm -hmm. And as an organization, we are part of engaging KCDI, Kenya Curriculum Institute, to ensure that animal welfare was then driven from primary school into secondary mm -hmm. school into uh, the universities. We worked with universities to develop a curriculum around animal welfare. So there's a lot of work going there just to try and raise the, the level of awareness around animal welfare. And part of it is then challenging you after a program like this, how then do you prove, uh, push mm -hmm. that narrative? Is it going to end with you or are you going to then inform your neighbor that certain things have been discussed that right. are of importance to us right. as a nation? Uh, Dr. Magero, there's a very important question, uh, as he put it, that the government is the driver of apathy to animal welfare, particularly when it comes to caged farming. What, your response to that? Uh, you realize that um, issues of animal welfare worldwide is driven by the consumer. In this country, we have the caged, uh, caged birds, and especially for egg production, okay? In those countries that you mentioned out there, it's the consumers who came out strongly and said they don't want those eggs. So the eggs, I mean, the birds actually had to come out of the cages. However, if you look at the standards that I talked about at the Kenya Bureau of Standards, there's no caged birds, I mean, in, the, in those standards, okay? So we, we do believe that uh, if the consumers come out and say they don't want the, you know, the government only does what the population wants, eh? isn't it? So if the consumers can come out strongly and petition the producers not to produce eggs in the caged bags, I'm sure the cages will go. Right. Do I answer the others? All right. Um, uh, I think because we actually have just six minutes to go. Uh, Steve, you want to add something to that? Well, just a, a quick point, because I obviously have lived in um, a country or part of the European Union, we still are at the moment in the UK part of the European Union, that's actually banned uh, the barren battery cage. Um, and I was hugely disappointed to see that, um, you know, it's actually been, if you like, exported from Europe uh, into countries like uh, Kenya. Um, there's a reason why uh, we banned it, and, and you're right, of course, the consumer has a choice, the consumer has a voice, and I, I've also learned tonight that you are all the government, uh, and so is everyone listening and watching this, so I appeal to you all as the government uh, and, and our friend here to follow the lead on this one. Um, you really should uh, stop uh, barren battery cages uh, spreading through this wonderful country, because you know, we are already asking of, uh, these, of a hen. We are already asking it for its eggs. We are asking for its meat. The least we could do is treat it with dignity and respect mm. and deliver the five freedoms. I heard everyone here say that we do respect the five freedoms. You do not respect the five freedoms in Kenya if you keep birds in barren battery cages. Right. A quick addition to that, Dr. Ayam. My quick addition to this is we also need to look at the environment that we are operating in. The same people and the same uh, supermarkets and fast food restaurants that have burnt caged, caged eggs are already in this country. The reality, based on what we do around what is known as business benchmark for farm animal welfare, where we rank this organization, is that that policy will apply to us. Our mm. question then is, if we are producing eggs in battery cage systems, which cannot get into the high value markets, are we not shooting ourselves in the foot? Mm. All right, and there's always a question of what is the call of action for you and I? Uh, and 
as wild animal protection, uh, there was that call to join their campaign for promoting animal welfare and protection. And to join this campaign, which is a call to action, uh, what you'd need to do is to text the word join to the number 409, and I think we'll be running it if you're watching from home uh, on our screens, uh, 40975. So you text the, the word join to 40975, and I think uh, with that, then you, you've registered your participation in this campaign. Does it cost anything, Lucy? All right, and it's free of charge. So that is a call to action uh, for you and I. And Dr. Tabitha, in, in, in the times that we live in now, there's an, a lot of, unfortunately, we are experiencing natural disasters as well as man-made ones. How important is it to talk about the planning for disasters, response, recovery, uh, with animals in mind? Are we doing enough in dis disaster situations? I would say we are not doing enough. And we, I can't categorize disasters into those disasters that are very, very specific for animals, particularly the disasters we deal with in our organization, in, my, in the unit I work for, because we deal with the emergency uh, disease situations that are transboundary that cut across countries. So that is a bit easy because that it's the technical people responding to their technical area. So they, they, they plan better. The, the complexity comes when you have disasters that affect people, animals, and many other things. Mm -hmm. Because human welfare always is given higher priority than animal welfare. So even if technical people sometimes they are aware and they plan within the national disasters that when there, is, there are floods, we need to think about animals. Mm -hmm. When it comes to resource allocation, what we see is that uh, sometimes if, when a disaster is evolving, like you have always seen about drought, it's only when people start dying and people start getting affected that you start seeing now re resources being released to, to address that emergency. And right. it happens even when you are earthquakes. You have an earthquake somewhere else in the world. What will happen is that people will try to, uh, to save people and try to evacuate people, try to treat people. But the animals will be forgotten. As much as the technical people will say you need to look at the animals, the resources will be allocated more to save human beings. So the technical people are aware, but then now we need to improve their awareness to those people who allocate resources so that they can allocate resources for both human beings and animals. Right, and uh, because we only have less than two minutes to wrap this up, I will, I, I will, I will address, or rather, let's get the voice of, of government, as now we are calling it now. When we are, what are we carrying out of this conversation in terms of call to action in, for both the public development actors and policies? Very shortly, I'll ask you and Steve. Uh, well, I'd ask the, the Kenyan people Please take care of your animals. Don't wait to be policed, because you realize that uh, animal welfare is your welfare, and it's also the welfare of the environment. Animal welfare actually does a lot for your well-being, and therefore, please uh, take care of your animals. Look for information from any government office. Those offices are your offices and where you are where you are not sure of what you are doing all the offices are open right steve i guess my quick response is number 1 celebrate this is a wonderful country you have you know a fantastic relationship to many of the animals uh, that live here and it's home to some of the most beautiful and diverse um, places and uh, species so i would really urge you to do all you can to protect what you have. Uh, they really are national treasures. And if you're not careful, you will find you lose them. You'll lose the wild species, and you will lose your farm animals into industrial farms. So that is what I would encourage you to do. Learn the lessons from what we got wrong uh, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, but also cherish that which you have, because it's, it's precious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Abby, I don't know if you have one comment uh, from social media that we All right. can read. Perhaps not from social media, okay. Sharon, but uh, 
just by a show of hands. I want to see how many people have been transformed tonight. <laughs> How many of us will now report our neighbors, even if it's your relative, <laughs> <laughs> who is showing some cruelty to the animals by a show of hands? Sharon. Fantastic. Transform Kenya. I guess that we, our job here tonight is done, and I believe there's a lot that's going on, even on social media. We can't continue uh, with this conversation. Remember, the hashtag that we are using on social media is, is this a life and uh, hashtag also transform Kenya SG. There's a lot that we still need to talk about. Uh, we don't have to end it in this particular forum. So let's continue having that and holding each other to account. So let me thank our panelists tonight. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I want us to give them a round of applause. Uh, we have. Steve McIver is the CEO of World Animal Protection. Dr. Joanne Maguero is Assistant Director of Veterinary Services at the State Department of Livestock. That's at the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries. Dr. Tabitha Kimani, on my immediate left, is Campaigns Manager, Animals in Farming. I'm sorry, uh, is a Regional Social Economist at FAO's Emergency Center. And Dr. Victor Yamo is Campaigns Manager, Animals in Farming, Wild Animal Protection Africa. Thank you very much, our panelists, and thank you to our audience for being here tonight and for this very lovely conversation. That's where we wrap it up tonight. Thank you so much. My name is Sharon Omani and Abby Agina. We ro roll it out now from uh, Desmond Tutu Conference Hall in Westlands. Have a good night. The conversation on our social media platforms to discuss and create awareness on animal welfare and sustainable utilization of animals in a world where they live free.